Hello and welcome back to the Eagle Griffin Games vlog, and this week we'll interview the designer of Clockwork Wars and Maniacal, and we'll follow that by a sneak peek of the print and play update to Clockwork Wars. Then we'll have a new segment called Creator's Corner. Now this week in that segment, we'll take a look at a solo play of Vital Lacerda's Escape Plan. In the Eggs from the Vault segment, we'll give you a quick overview of a game where you're the CEO of an off-world mining mega corporation in the year 2288, and then we'll finish it off with a game giveaway. But first, let's update you on a Kickstarter that's live right now. The Railways of the World Expansion's Kickstarter campaign for Railways of Sweden, Railways of Australia, and Rail Barons of the World is in full swing as it's funded many times over with well over a thousand backers. These three new Railways of the World series expansions each bring something new to the series. The campaign will run from now until May 28th, so back now if you want to climb aboard this campaign before it ends. So click the link below to be brought directly to the Kickstarter project page. Games designer Hassan Lopez received a BA in Psychology from Harvard University and a PhD in Psychology and Neuroscience from University of California at Santa Barbara. He's also a professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at Skidmore College. He's designed both Clockwork Wars and Maniacal for Egan Griffin Games. Let's welcome in Hassan Lopez. I'm a professor of psychology and neuroscience at a small liberal arts college in upstate New York, Skidmore College. Been doing that for about 15 years. I love my job. I think it's fantastic. I really like the fact that I get to mix uh, teaching of courses to undergraduates alongside of research, working in the laboratory, discovering new things. My specific area of scholarly interest is in psychopharmacology, how drugs influence the brain and behavior. We've explored how cannabinoids affect seizure activity, long-term effects of cannabinoids on adolescent brain development, and a number of other projects over the years. Well, it might sound cliche to say this, but I actually started designing games when I was quite young. Um, I recall that the very first board game I designed, I was around 11 years old. I actually sent that off for submission to a publisher and got a positive response. And then that company went bankrupt and I never heard from them again. So that's the beginning of my game design career. Obviously, I think playing role-playing games as um, a preteen and teenager like Dungeons and Dragons was very influential on me in terms of game design. As a dungeon master, creating my own game worlds gave me a lot of creative freedom and started, I think, um, getting me to think about game mechanics and stories and narratives that I could put players into. In terms of the modern era, I didn't really jump back into real game design with um, sort of a professional goal of publishing those designs until around 2005 or so. And that was also around the time when I got back into modern board gaming very heavily. And um, I would say that the it when, when that started up again, it, it started up because I was playing games and discovering that I was trying to modify them and tweak the rules and come up with house rules to, to make the, the gameplay a bit smoother. And then all of a sudden I started jotting down notes about a, a new board game that eventually became Clockwork Wars. And once I got that game off the ground and a, an eagle responded positively to it, that was the, all the encouragement I needed to, to keep things going. Well, there, there's two separate stories there, but I would say that the, a common thematic or a common inspirational element to both those designs was video games. Um, I've often loved video games, have played them most of my life. And in the case of Clockwork Wars, um, I, was, I was very much inspired by real-time strategy games, things like, for example, Rise of Legends. Um, and in particular, the the idea of having a battle game where there was simultaneous action going on between the players. So you wasn't just like another standard you go, I go turn taking war game, but one in which you really had to 
think about and compensate for the fact that your opponent was making decisions about where to deploy troops at the same time that you were. And that was the, the birth of the idea for the hidden simultaneous deployment that is at the heart of Clockwork Wars. In terms of its thematic elements, it being um, inspired by steampunk, I think that just that came largely from my love of the steampunk genre, the books, games, the whole shebang. Um, and it just at the time, this was 2012, well, earlier when I first started creating that game, um, there just weren't a lot of steampunk board games out there. So it seemed like a vibrant new territory that I could explore when it came to um, a new theme that would appeal to gamers. Uh, for Maniacal, again, inspired by video games, and in this case, kind of like the, the 90s bullfrog era of simulation games, things like Dungeon Keeper, but especially Evil Genius. Evil Genius, I would say, is a direct inspiration for Maniacal. And also my love of comic books. I've, I love comic books. My kids love comic books. They're, they're a mainstay in our household. And so the idea of creating a board game around a supervillain who's creating a, a secret base somewhere and gathering henchmen, which he or she can then send out into the world to do their bidding, that just seemed like such an exciting theme for a game. And I should say that in, in, in both of these designs, and I think this is going to hold true for all my subsequent designs as well, it, it does tend to start with theme. I usually have an idea for a game experience that I want my players to have, um, a narrative experience that I want to provide them, and then the mechanics will, will come in later. Now, they, they tend to come in quite rapidly, like in the case of Clockwork Wars, that simultaneous deployment idea was very much at the, at the start of that design. But I can't design in a thematic vacuum. I need there to be some trappings, some, some, some imagery in my mind for me to make any progress on a game design. Since Clockwork Wars was released in 2015, designer Hassan Lopez states he's been thrilled to watch a passionate community of fans grow around this game. He's had numerous conversations with many of you and continued to think about how to support and improve Clockwork Wars. He states it became clear to him that numerous card effects in the game were slightly off and would benefit from some subtle tweaking. His overall design philosophy towards these changes has been one of modest change versus radical overall. Discovery cards were always supposed to be absurdly powerful, and the espionage cards purveyors of chaos and agony, but some were too strong, others weak sauce. Eagle Griffin has released a print and play update to Clockwork Wars to address these changes. Now this update represents the designer's latest attempt to rebalance what ultimately can never be perfectly balanced. Hassan also long wanted to expand the game's potential and variability through the addition of more spy master actions and general abilities. As such, in this update you'll find some brand new tools with which to make your enemies suffer. We hope this convinces you to get those Rhinox to the table at least one more time. The link to the print and play update to Clockwork Wars can be found in the description below. In Sharon Inc., you find yourself as a CEO of a mega corporation in the year 2288, and you're colonizing the largest moon of the dwarf planet Pluto. You'll be trying to gather all sorts of different resources, and you'll be using those resources to build things like outposts, factories, power plants, galactic exchanges, and research centers, gaining you a different amount of points depending on how many resources it takes to build it. The game's played over four rounds, and each round, players are going to be taking their flags from one of these spots and placing it in one of the zones trying to gain influence here. This one gives influence in only this zone, where this spot gives it influence in both of these zones and this bot getting influence in all four of those zones. And after each player has placed four of their flags, each zone will get looked at to see who has the most influence. And here, red and blue both have two, but if you're in the middle, you have the tiebreaker. And that allows you to gain all of the resources in that zone. But after all the flags have been placed, will be one left of everyone's, and if there's a small enough amount of flags on these spaces, those players will be able to take special abilities. This one, Stolen Intelligence, allows you to move a flag you control on the board, and this allows you to do it before you even see who has the most influence. Or maybe you'll be taking a wild, clear gem. Or maybe gaining another card that you'll be using to possibly construct later. Or maybe changing some gems of a color into the same amount of gems of another color. 
But if there's too many flags in a certain spot, then that action won't be taken from anyone. Then players will be turning in those resources to fulfill cards like the factory and get six points, and they can do this from cards in their hand or ones in this common row that were seated by all the players at the beginning of the game simultaneously. You'll reset the board and do it again, and you'll play this for four rounds. At the end of the fourth round, whoever has the most points from all of the cards that they've built wins the game. Sharon Inc. is for two to five players for ages 13 and up and plays in 60 minutes, and it's available now. So click the link below to be brought right to the product page. Hi everybody, this is Mark from Notboard Gaming, a YouTube channel which is totally devoted to the pleasures of solo and soloable board games. And today I want to talk about one of my favourite solo games of all time. And that game is, of course, Escape Plan by Vital Lacerda. So what is it about Escape Plan that I love so much as a solo experience? Well, I think first of all, thematically, it absolutely shines as a solo experience. As you know, if you know anything about Escape Plan, a heist has taken place and you've got to find safe passage out of the city, taking with you as much cash as possible, avoiding the police that are around there. You're going to be jumping on helicopters. You're going to be kind of running across the city. You're going to be using the tube system. You're going to be going to safe houses. You're going to be buying equipment. You're going to be avoiding the police and you're going to be avoiding both Lieutenant Costa and Sandra as well and Costa is a little bit corrupt. It all feels wonderfully thematic as the game progresses and you're trying to find out which exit you've got to get to. The city starts to close in a little bit more on you. It feels like you're playing just this fantastic action movie where you are the kind of protagonist, the key person in the movie and you're using everything in this ever-closing city to get to the right exit to escape with your wares. As I say, from a solo perspective, that just feels wonderfully thematic. As well as just kind of the theme of the game as well, the fact that you are effectively controlling two AIs as well as yourself just feels great. It gives more player agency. They're both so simple to control. So first of all, we have Sandra, and if you know Lacerda games, Sandra appears in a lot of Lacerda games, and she's kind of going around the city and she's going to block you going to safe houses and maybe block you going to certain buildings to get cash or to, to get some stash, etc. So Sandra is not necessarily gunning for you, but she's doing a lot out there and kind of messing up your plans. More dastardly is Lieutenant Costa right here. And Lieutenant Costa, let's say he's, um, he's less than straight edge. He's a little bit corrupt and you may have to pay fines. And his movement is dependent on where you are on the map. There is just so much going on and so much to think about as a solo player. It feels like, as I say, that you're having this exciting action movie adventure. For me, Escape Plan absolutely shines as a solo experience. And if you've got any kind of uh, thoughts about getting a Lacerda game purely for solo, then Escape Plan should be really at the top of the list there because it gives you that wonderful Lacerda experience whilst being exceptionally unique at the same time. So for me, it's a stone cold recommendation. Escape Plan by Vita Lacerda, with wonderful production values by Eagle Griffin Games, and of course, the fantastic artwork by Ian O'Toole. As I say, my name's Mark. My channel is Not Board Gaming, a channel completely devoted to the joys of solo and soloable gaming. Thank you very much. Bye bye. <laughs>